Welcome back to the $1 million Tipping Point podcast. I have a super fun podcast today. I have never done this, but we have a mother-daughter interview, and hopefully this is going to go awesome. They're in two different realms of business, so I think we're going to get a lot of information from them. So we've got Mary Beth McKenzie, and we've got Kimberly Spencer. So as a reminder to our audience, we are brought to you by the Tipping Jar of Wisdom, where as a newsletter subscriber, you get access to exclusive content every Thursday straight to your inbox from our guests with actionable items that will help you grow your business. So head over and connect with me on Instagram at virtually Kiri or LinkedIn, Kiri Mohan, and you can sign up through my bio. All right, here we go. So Mary Beth McKenzie, she's the mother here for everyone listening. Um, She is an artist turned certified arborist. When her daughter, Kimberly, was born 35 years ago, Mary Beth quit her job as a graphic designer to support her husband in growing his tree business. She went on to become one of the few female certified arborists in the field and co-president of the company, serving over 6,000 customers in Los Angeles, California for nearly 40 years. Kimberly Spencer is the CEO of Crown Yourself Enterprises, LLC. She transforms leaders' stories from stuck to scalable, so you unlock your full potential and the potential of those you serve, from your team to your customers to your family. So welcome again. I'm excited to have you both on. Thanks so much for having us. We are excited to be here. Yes. So I'd love to jump in, Mary Beth, with you. Um I have a funny story. So I'm one of those people who loves trees in our neighborhood because they give a nice screen to like all the houses. I'm I'm lucky enough to live in an area. It's not, it's not rural. It's definitely suburbia, but there's a little bit more space on all the properties. And we had about two years ago, two houses being built at the same time, one in front of us, one right next to us. And I got on the zoning call and, you know, I said, I don't care how big the house is that you make because everything's going really big here. I said, I just want the trees to stay. I just want the trees to stay. And they were like, sure, we can agree to that. We can agree to the trees being sta- like staying there. I got off the call. I didn't realize all like most of the neighbors were on the call and they all were teasing me for weeks, calling me a tree hugger. <laughs> <laughs> but then they would come up to me privately and they would say, oh, we kind of wish we had done that as well when X house was being built. We didn't think to like not argue the size, but instead argue the the trees to stay and to remain because usually they just rip them all out, you know. So I am known in this neighborhood as the tree hugger, which is kind of funny. <laughs> So talk to me a little bit about your graphic design career and how long you were a graphic designer before going into being an arborist. Well, I knew um, I had always been interested in art and I majored in art in college. And I had been doing, my husband was in the military. um, And when he was there, I was working as a graphic artist with the military training aides for the generals and stuff. When we came back, um, we were obviously on unemployment and we went and settled in L.A. so that he could become a famous actor. And um, uh, his second love was plants. But I went out and I went into this store and I saw a little tiny health food store and I saw the labels for the products that they were putting out, the nuts and all that stuff it was a pretty poor label. And I said, you know, I could design something better. And so when I went back to the apartment that we were living in and I I said, I think I know what I'm going to do. And I threw the money down on the bed and said, this is it. I'm going to do freelance graphic art. So that's what I did for several years. Um, And then when I, after many years of doing that, just freelance gathering customers and stuff, um, the computer came in about the same time my daughter came in. And it would have meant me spending about $35,000 and training to know how to do what I was doing with, this was just basic graphics computer at that time. And I said, I can go into debt and do that and train and not have time for my daughter, or I can help my husband out. My husband wanted to be an actor and he did some acting, but wasn't making a great deal of money at it. And um, I realized when he went out for bids, because he started a tree business to be the supplement to the acting, um, that he was throwing away the bids. He had no concept of office and maintaining and developing anything. So I said, I'll help you out. And I started out answering the phones and setting up a filing system and all that. And he was very charming. 
and people really trusted him and he did wonderful work. So he was working out of a pickup truck with a chainsaw and two guys he got his helpers said we want to work for you so now he now he had two employees and then as he went on he had to get to become a contractor and then a certified arborist system came in and then i was answering the phone as she was growing and becoming a little bit more independent i i went and got my certified arborist because that came in and um, then I, we got somebody to answer the phone. So it was really organic the way it all grew. As she grew, I was able to go out more and do bids because Rock was bidding. That was my husband's name. He, he was bidding all through Saturdays and there was no time for him to be at home. So I said, well, I'll do the small trees. You do the big stuff. And then I went out there. And so I became a certified arborist after him. And I used to kid that uh, at the conventions, because you have to take continuing education units, um, that there was no line for the women's bathroom at those conventions. <laughs> and <laughs> so how rare is that? The door. As it was 95% <laughs> men. Um, so there was a line for the men's bathroom, but there wasn't a line for the women's bathroom because there were so few women arborists at that time. But And then the business just grew. Um, I developed an advertising campaign at Christmas. So I sent out Christmas cards with our little face, family face on it, saying thank you for the work. And that brought in continuing customers. And that was uh, um, a really great idea. It was burdensome after a while, because every year around Thanksgiving, we had to all get dressed up and make a picture and stuff like that. <laughs> but that helped develop the business from what most people do when they go for trees, they don't remember who the tree company is. I found out later, these little pictures we were sending out at Christmas, just Christmas time, um, people were putting it on their refrigerators to remember to call that tree service. And I couldn't believe that. I mean, I'm going, oh, wow, we're not part of your family. But they thought of us that way because we're a small business. And some people save them from like all the oh, years. Wow. Yeah. And when my husband and I got engaged, we brought him into the picture and I got so many messages from Facebook friends around Los Angeles who were like, or, or he 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 actually got so many messages like, I didn't know you were marrying Rock's daughter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. So that's a simple technique that you didn't even really go out there to specifically as like, this is a marketing technique I'm going to do. It sounds like it was more like, you know, I want people to remember us. It's just like a friendly way to like send a thank you almost. Actually, for Lee using Iacocca services. gave me the idea. Who? Lee Iacocca, oh, head of okay. Chevrolet, I think at the time. Oh, he was okay. personally going out doing advertising. And I said, the face with the logo. I created a logo because that was my graphic background. And I thought, uh, and quite accidentally it happened. A friend, when Kim was about three or four, took a picture of us right in front of uh, Rock's truck, which happened to have the sign on it. Mm. And I'm going, oh, let's send these out as Christmas cards. But I thought of leak iacocca and coming forward as the face of chevrolet and i'm going okay this would really rather than most companies send out this generic christmas card you know with mm -hmm. names on it but they don't have the faces of the people and they like it. sign it or maybe their assistant right. signs it. i get tons right. of those i throw them in the trash but you're right the ones with the photos i put up because it's just like this personal connection like our real estate agents i mean we're not looking to buy a new house every year Every year mm -hmm. a Christmas card. And like, of course, I'm going to go to them if we ever decide to sell or buy again, because I remember them because every winter they send us a Christmas card. Such and a good people, marketing technique. People really remember faces better than they remember names. So, yes. And I was just thinking, actually, the chimney company we used at our old house. We when we bought in our new house, this current house, we wanted to get the chimneys looked at. Couldn't remember who it was. I didn't keep the information. I had to go and do the whole search again online, try to find them. And then I couldn't. I ended up with a new company. But if they had sent me a Christmas card, I would have remembered them. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. And I yes. started modeling that that card with family photos with my company um, a couple years ago. And we didn't do it while we lived in Australia. But um, yeah, we've we've done that regularly for a couple of years and it has stimulated business, even though I have an online business and I've grown that it still is a beautiful, like tangible tactile reminder. And I got that idea both from my mom, but then Joe Polish was the one who was like physical markings. It still works. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I was like, well, let's give it a go. And, and I got a lot of 
customer retention from that. I was just thinking, you know, I should, I I look at my list every year and I usually, if I haven't heard from a client in three or four years, take them off the Christmas card list. But now I'm thinking maybe I should keep them on. So then of course, because it's not just like maybe they don't need the help, but maybe they know someone and having that Christmas card just being like, oh yeah, we know this arborist, you know, Mm -hmm. here's the info, here's a Christmas card and just pull it up and voila. Well, it was really funny. I mean, a few years ago, um, someone said, you know, I went to three people to get a referral for a tree service and they all mentioned the same company, ours. Um, So yes, people spin off and the physical tangible uh, Christmas card rather than an email because they're so... Think of the amount of time you put in with an email is the value that it has for people. They are transitory. They're easy to be erased. They're they're not as permanent. And how many emails do we get every day? Um, like, I know I'm regularly unsubscribing. In fact, I had my assistant, like, go through my entire inbox to just be like, just, just get me off the list I just know. because it was getting so much versus having that tactile thing that for those who are highly kinesthetic, which is like a mindset uh, piece of how we experience the world, that touch is is very important. And they know you yeah. spent more time and it has more value. So the the family picture, the ju- and I turned it to from a, a mailing in an envelope to a postcard for cost. I mean, mm. it's easier for the people, you know, they don't have to open something but also the cost for mailing because I was getting up to 5,000 people. And I could, if I did it myself, putting labels and stamps, I was getting to the point where I thought, well, maybe I'll have a service do this, but I could punch them out within three days, three or four days, you know, just stamps, labels, stamps, labels and stuff. Did Kimberly just, help you? Cause I had, I had my daughter. I, I, I did. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Our family, because my my aunt, my mom's sister, was her, the secretary for a long time um, for their company. And so it was very much a family job around Christmas where, like, we would come in. I remember, like, some of my cousins would come in as, as well. And <laughs> we would just bang it out in a day. Um, like, I don't rec- – like – absolutely delegate to family members if they're open to but I'm like with my CEOs that I work with now I'm like delegate that your time (laughs) is worth much more it was getting to the point where I was thinking of a service and everything like that but my life changed about three years ago when my husband died and so running the business and doing all that and dealing with uh, my husband died in 2021 January and my sister and my mother died January 2022 oh, gosh so there was a lot and I was executor for all those things and I'm going and fortunately we had made a partnership with this other company um uh to be handling the labor part of it uh, in Los Angeles <clears throat> labor is is very difficult <clears throat> and we had to develop um I developed a um forms for the employees to sign, you know, because to keep on top of if they had injuries or anything like that. And those forms really helped me out too. Because that was one of the learning curves that my dad was very trusting as a business owner. And he, he would, he's like, I mean, gosh, he would have loved Texas because it's still like, oh, it's a handshake country. Like he was very honorable in that way. If you have a handshake deal, he, he would have honored it, but mm. not everybody works that way. And so I've, I've always been, I learned very early on in my career to get things in writing because I saw how badly my family was burned several times um, from employees and um, other experiences where it was a handshake deal and and then it didn't pan out. Um, Do you in, have in an example most- that you could bring up so our listeners can learn well, from that husband, experience? My husband fired a guy and then he begged to come back and he kept a diary And he brought us before the Labor Relations Board in Los Angeles, claiming we didn't pay what we paid. Um, Some of the guys uh, wanted cash, and we didn't keep a record of it at that time. And um, we had to learn from that experience. So it took about 40 years for me to finally develop a form where they're signing saying, yes, they got this cash, or they didn't have any injuries. And uh, it helped but it was after the fact. It really helped. How long 
was your business running? I mean, I guess it still is because you were bought out, which we mentioned off air. But how long were you a part of the business with your husband? Up until three months ago. <laughs> yeah, uh, 35 years. It her birth. So um, okay, so right. In your age, it's okay. But, but uh, mm -hmm. I started working for the company that Rock had started <clears throat> about the time she was born, because that's when the graphic art business and went to computers. And I going, okay, I'll make the transition over. So it sounds like there were definitely some mishaps along the way. Like you didn't do that form right away. You should have done that sooner. You had a couple of issues with employees. What do you think are the top three lessons you've learned having a business for that long? Um, number one, to have a connection with your customers. That was the Christmas cards. Mm -hmm. and that was, more the than, that, was, that was more than just the Christmas cards as well. Like they, one of the lessons that I learned was just that very intimate personal connection. Your customers are your base of business. And my dad was always, he would take any call. My mom would take any call from a customer, um, not while with another customer. That was a big piece of just respecting the other customer's time if you were in a conversation, but they would always be responsive to their customers, regularly responding with in, in a timely manner in to, timely to manner. what to what it was. And that was the big training point when I started coming on helping them with marketing operations and um, hiring that that was one of the training pieces of, of training their assistants, their operations managers to be able to respond in a timely manner that like it's especially when it's someone's looking for a tree service or uh, so they're looking for something with probably speed because sometimes people don't think about their trees until it's too late. And so that's when that responsive time in a timely manner is very important. Hmm. Mm, All especially right. if you're working with contractors, because contractors want the work done yesterday. <laughs> yes, they, <laughs> they usually don't think about the trees when they're building something. And then they, they do more now because the cities have put in regulations on trees. But they would just not think about, oh, we're going to pile a whole bunch of stuff and store it next to the tree or, you know, um, construction equipment. Yeah, they're going to, you know, go over roots and stuff. It's it, it's been a training experience for contractors also, but what was another these, lesson? Another lesson for dealing with contractors? No, from, <laughs> that you're no, from your business, business, from being in business so long. I'm um, keeping um, really good records. I would do a day log every day where our work is and I'd make notes on them and then save them so that if you were getting slow, you might call every two years to go go back to those customers and see whether they wanted. And the nice thing about trees is they're outside. So if you're going by a house that happens to be a customer, you can see if there's a problem. It's not like a plumber or an electrician who's dealing with something mm -hmm. inside. Um, but every few years, if there's been more rain, so the um, when one year, some years there were heavy rain, so you know that they're going to need to prune the tree more often than in the drought cycle, um, uh, you know, trees, that's specifically to the tree industry. But I think the paperwork for the employees and the training and all that, all this added on. So when you first started out, when my husband first started out, it was a pickup truck and a chainsaw, and there was no certified arborist, and there was no requirement to be a contractor. Then in California came and you had to be a contractor. So he got his contractor's license. And then it came in that you had to be a certified arborist. They were, the International Society of Arboriculture was upscaling the quality of the tree industry. So then you had to have that. And then you have continuing ongoing education units that you had to do. All that added on. It was not initially there in the beginning. I think, yeah, your business really grew as the tree industry right. grew and right. matured as well. And I think one of the things that, that my dad said toward the end of his life, like I remember standing because eventually when it was when I was about 15 or so, I think you you got your first property to like park all the trucks like they'd been previously renting a property and then they got they actually purchased a property and got an investment property and then they grew and expanded and got another commercial investment property. Um, and I remember when we were, uh, my parents were selling that commercial investment property. And my dad and I were looking around this giant lot 
with all of these massive, like 15 trucks and just heaps of space and plants. And and I was like, dad, did you ever think that you would build something of this size? He said, no. <laughs> he, just, he just put his, he said, we just put our head down and we just worked. And he, and he said, I said, well, what would you have done differently? And he said he would have hired teams sooner. He would have hired people sooner. And that's what he really encouraged me to, to do earlier on, especially when I first started, started my first business when I was 19, teaching Pilates. He's like, find a way to replace yourself. And he, he always- That was your first serious job, but I remember you at five <laughs> going around selling bags of water or pictures- Litter that- water. Uh, pictures that were you know a heart and saying it's five cents or fifty dollars you know oh, I was split testing price points <laughs> <laughs> having a daughter around age seven right now I can totally see that like absolutely the glitter water she'd be oh, all yeah. over that yeah <laughs> also the advantage for her was the fact that we had our office in our home so she um she saw what we actually did on it. It wasn't like we were going to an office or anything like that. So yeah. she was more intimately around what was going on with the business. And I, and think, I think that's, that's a value. Yeah, I think that is value. And I think that's a big one. I, I come from my dad's an entrepreneur. He started on his business, but he has his own office. He always has had his own office. So I didn't understand really what went into building a business, growing a business, having a business. Yeah. It was just this far off thing like, oh, dad's in the office. Got to, you know, and like we weren't allowed to call him either. That was like a big thing. Like, <laughs> can you know, be like, I can't find mom. Can I go to so-and-so's house? He's like, are you really calling me for this? <laughs> like, so it was always like this, like far off. Like my dad's off in the office. Don't disturb him. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, the thing that I, um, one of the things I remember is the neighbor across the street was going to start a pager business when pagers were in and she asked me for advice and I said it's going to take more time than you think it is and she's mm. constantly told me that yeah it's and I mean it's so true a bit it's more so true. graceful with time because there's especially in the online world you'll see so many marketing advertisements of like we scaled to eight figures in nine months or we you know hit your first 10k months in 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 three weeks and you know these these very big promises which are absolutely possible but I mean I remember when I first started like I started my my coaching business but it was right after I'd been bought out of my e-commerce business. And so I was very much in like the dungeon of doubt because I had dealt with three months of dealing with lawyers uh, and professional men telling me, you know, I was too young. I was underqualified. I was, um, <laughs> I had all, of, I had all of these men telling me these things to try to drive my price down for a buyout. Um, I didn't know that then, but now I, I know. And I held, I held my own, got the buyout, and then I was able to. Um, I went off on my honeymoon, and I was like, "What do I do?" Because we literally signed the buyout agreement three weeks before I, I got married, and I got went on off on my honeymoon. I was like, "What do I do when I get back?" Because I'd had multiple different careers. I was blessed that I had parents that um, supported my decision not to go to college. Like even my mom saw how depressed I was in high school in the standardized education system, and. And she's like, Kim, you're a hustler. Like, whatever you want to do, you're going to do it. So if you want to drop out of high school, you can. Like, what parent says that? That's she amazing. I remember sometimes saying that. No, I don't remember that. <laughs> I do remember saying you don't have to go to college unless you're going to be a doctor or something. Yeah. And so I ended up getting to call. I finished high school, got two college scholarships, dropped out of college two weeks before I was supposed to start um, for an acting class because I wanted to go into Hollywood and I wanted to be a screenwriter. What else do you do in Hollywood? I mean, it's all around you. So, you know, the well, first thought is. And that that really was my model of like, I didn't see anybody making the income and the impact that I wanted to make that wasn't in Hollywood. That was my model of what was mm. successful. And so I, I got to chase that dream and be a part of that and had my first film produced when I was 24 um, that I co-wrote and then realized that, that I was only about 90% fulfilled, went off and got the opportunity to become a president of an e-commerce company that was actually a customer of my dad's who had connected me because of my Pilates background, because I'd been teaching Pilates as a bridge job. And that experience, we got to take our product to market, got to get it featured in all the national magazines. And, you know, I pitched it to the first round of Shark Tank auditions. And then three months before 
my wedding, my business partner said he wanted to buy me out and I was devastated. I was like, and I, in hindsight, I was very grateful because I was so stressed. I was, it wasn't a, a partnership that was in alignment with my values. It wasn't a business. He wanted a little garage business. That's what he didn't want. You no, know, he did want a big business. He did want a big business, but he, he wanted to, I can't say what he wanted, but I can definitely say that I don't think buying an office or renting an office was the most um, wise. wise use of our capital. Um, but those were the decisions that he wanted to that he wanted to make. Um, and mine, I'm much more scrappy when it comes to entrepreneurship, probably because I was raised that way. And like my mom was pushing each. You, you didn't say how you pushed me around in the stroller, passing out flyers <laughs> <laughs> at the very beginning. At the very beginning, just to get to 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 get the business. And so I knew the value of sales, but unfortunately, I went I went through that buyout process, and I was left in the position that I'd never been in. Like I'd always been very audacious with my career. When I wanted to write a screenplay, I said, let me write it. Um, and when I wanted to go and teach Pilates, I went off and I did that. And like within six months I would be certified. So I was always very audacious with my career. And I attribute that to my, to my parents and how bold I, the lesson of boldness that I learned just from, you go out there and you do it. Like no one's gonna do it for you as an mm -hmm. entrepreneur, except for your team who you hire. Um, but you're the one who's driving that ship. You're the captain of it. And on my honeymoon, I came up with the idea. I said, you know, I love fitness. I love health. I love writing. I love storytelling. I love relationships. I've done entrepreneurship. And I saw this holistic picture of coaching that I didn't really see in the industry. It wasn't specifically life coaching, but it was more like life and business combined so that we're not thinking of our business in a box that we go to or in our life in a box, in a separate mm. box. And I, I leaped off the couch after way too many espressos. I said, crown yourself. And this is what I'm doing. And my husband's like, what's that? And I said, I have no idea, but it's something like Marie Forleo. And <laughs> so, so I went out and did what every entrepreneur that I advise not to do. And I did all the productive procrastination activities of getting the fancy website and doing all the things yeah. that make a business look good, but I wasn't actually get generating any cash flow. Because I really think scary. a lot of entrepreneurs get stuck in that. Yeah. And I, and I I mean, I'm starting a new business right now and I got I get stuck in it. And I had yeah. like this light bulb moment last week, like what you're doing is not driving your business forward. What are the like top three things you need to do to drive your business forward? And that's and customers. Like, ABC and I was like, all right, that's what you need to focus on. Stop yep. getting distracted by the banner that isn't showing up properly on your website. Like, <laughs> like right? Yep. Right? The so like, thing... how do you advise people then who get stuck in that? TLC. With your own business? They, need, they need TLC, traffic leads and conversions. That's it. And that's, you just need to give your business that TLC, that little bit of love, baby. And everything else is no scrubs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... Rock used to say it. He said it's getting customers and getting paid. Yeah, getting customers and getting paid. Um, that's that's the biggest thing. And if I mean, I I worked with one client who literally had done everything on the mental, emotional realms of like affirmations and the vision board and mm. the brand photo shoot and and you know sound healing and I'm like have you made an offer <laughs> she's like what do you mean and I said well to, to, the only thing you need it to get started to have your business not be a hobby that's like a fancy expensive hobby versus a actual business is you just need to get customers you need someone to exchange their cash for your products and services that's it so that's the the basic, basic thing. And that's what I didn't do for a year and a half. I, well, I did. I had one customer. I made $100. Um, <laughs> but then I found out I was pregnant and that changed everything because I realized that the person who I had become in that time of not making any money in my business and in self-doubt, I didn't want to be the mother of my children. Like I wanted someone who was empowered, someone who was courageous, someone who was bold, who was an example of what well that's the same motivation in a sense rock was going around auditioning and not making much money i was doing graphic arts it was nice i was making a nice money but um you being born and computers coming in at the same time as a big thing and i'm going 
we've got to make more money. And I said, the acting is very nice, Rock, but we got to concentrate on what's making money. And I said, I'm going to help you out in your tree business because I'm not going to learn computers and take time away from her. So we got to hustle. Yeah. We got to get, we, and you're, how do you really switch, serious when you have kids? How do you switch that mindset for people who I, don't have kids, right? Like, cause there are people who struggle yeah. with this, who don't have kids and like having a child is such a good impetus. Um, yeah. impetus sorry. <laughs> but like pregnant or you get a dog. <laughs> no, just, not everyone can do that. Just, so how do just we kidding. switch that? So how do we it, get for people who are stuck in that, you know, place where like they're not generating revenue? They're not and they have that fancy hobby. That so expensive think, hobby you said. Yeah. If you think of like what a child is, think of it's something that is outside of you that is a greater responsibility than you have for caring for yourself. And so I mean. I was talking to uh, another friend of mine who we talk every day about motherhood, business, whatnot. And she said, you know, I will tolerate eating cup of noodles and like work until dawn. But she was, I won't tolerate that for my kids. And so if you think about it metaphorically, what a child is, it's there's a level of tolerance for the floor, for the very bottom of which you will tolerate for yourself. Um, I love the quote that Tony Robbins says is you get what you tolerate. There's a, there's a level of tolerance that you have for what you will accept for yourself. And that has to be raised. A child automatically raises it because it's something outside of you that's this greater responsibility that suddenly raises your floor of what you will expect for yourself because you wouldn't want to have that for your child. So what is it that is meaningful enough to you? Maybe it's a cause. Maybe it's a purpose. Like in my company is what we've done is we now have created what we call the first 15 initiative. And uh, one of the greatest stories that you can ever transform in your mindset is one from being enslaved to your thoughts to being free and and experiencing that freedom. And yet there's still in the physical world, there is slavery as in human trafficking. And so we've created an initiative that's motivating my entire team that we're donating 15% of our profits to save 15 children this year from human trafficking. Mm. And so that that's something that's outside of ourselves. It's bigger than what we've done before that allows us to feel this motivation because there's a responsibility to something more than just us. And I mm. think that that's the shift that gets made when you become a parent is when something outside of you requires you to be more than just focused on your own stuff. Because we'll, we all will have a level of tolerance for some level of discomfort. And it's kind of like the pebble in your shoe where you can have that, you know, like it's, it's, it's annoying, it's nagging, but it's not, it's, it's not a point of friction until you're miles into the marathon and you're like, oh, that's, mm -hmm. that's a gaping wound right now. And that I cannot run any farther until I get that bandage. So it's figuring out what is that level of tolerance? How do you need to raise the floor for yourself? Mm. Mm. That's all great. That's really, really important, I think. Thank you. I would like to talk a little bit about your team, Kimberly, because you mm -hmm. mentioned Mary Beth, your team, and how you had grown. Um, let's talk about your team. How many people do you have on your team right now? Right now I have four, and they're all okay. freelancers. All freelancers, contractors yeah. only. And Mary Beth, you had employees, right? Or yes. were they all contractors to their employees? No, what do you uh, we had about eight employees. And we like what we follow is the exponential organizations model of of working with freelancers, but using leveraging team culture and creating an ethos. Even with our freelancers that we work with, they have to follow our company's ethos and believe in the values that we preach. What do you think, Kimberly, um, is the biggest difference between employees and contractors having seen your parents have employees and now working with contractors on your own? Um, I think it depends on your leadership because with contractors, you are, if they're, it depends on how they're paid or if they're paid by the project or if they're paid by the hour, if they're a regular contractor that you're working with on a regular basis, then there is, there is less of a, a fear of like we, of not having of if they you don't have something to give them that they have still have some other projects from other people that they can work on, um, but there still is a responsibility to like the amount of hours that we give them for uh, for working. 
And then I think sometimes with employees, there can be just the the safety net of employeeship, where if there's you don't have something to do, if you don't have an employee who's a self-starter, they'll just kind of sit there, hang back. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, you see sometimes with like what we noticed in the tree industry was down the street from our house, there was a tree that the city was pruning. There's no time factor with them. They took two days and they had a bucket truck. We would have been done in four hours. So it's, there's less motivation for that. But even still, when you have employees, you do have to stay. There is a, an expectation of just getting paid no matter what you do. And you have to work on keeping the quality up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and training them. Yes. And I think that the big thing is that with any person you hire, it's not about, it's about, you can train any skill set, but you can't train values. Like values are innate. They're a subconscious processing system as to how we make decisions. If somebody doesn't have the similar values of the company, then they're not going to be a right fit. And while you, you they may have a skill set that may fit for what you need, they may be work for a contractor, work as a contractor for a time, but to be a cohesive team, even if it is freelancers, that requires mutual company values, which was what I messed up on in my e-commerce company because in my partnership, we didn't have mutual values. We were making decisions in different ways. It wasn't that his values were good or my values were good. It was they were just different, which causes you to make decisions differently. Mm -hmm. And thus, if you're not on the same page with your leadership, not going it, you're, you're, you're not going to be going in the same direction. Yeah. apart from each other. I've actually interviewed quite a few people who have had business partnerships that haven't worked out. Mm -hmm. So what I would like to do is kind of ask almost like this twofold question. Mary Beth, you've grown your company and you sold it um, or got acquired. I'd like to hear advice on that for people who are looking to sell their company. And then Kimberly, I'd like to hear advice from you on the end of someone who has been bought out in a partnership, what to look for. Because the people I've interviewed so far have always been the one buying out someone else. Yeah. So Mary Beth, if you could start. Um, what is advice on how to sell a company successfully? Have a daughter that tells you to get a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> because we had done so much avoiding having lawyers uh, and we had done it on our own. We were just, uh, we started out with really just verbally dealing with the partnership part of it. And his work was uh, um, of the quality that we wanted. Um, and just advising him about different things on how to uh, run the business. He had been in business for three years, and he'd been a climber, which is a typical transition to make. Um, and he was a good businessman in a sense, but there were just some tweaks and stuff. So that was a lot of that was worked out verbally. But when we came to buying out and selling, this is after my husband died, uh, Kim was the one that advised getting a, a lawyer that does this and um, she processed through things that I didn't even think about. Mm -hmm. um, so it was important to get a lawyer that specifically does, specializes in that sort of thing. And I'm very grateful that we did because it really legitimized, you know, made it very legitimate what we were asking. Um, the other company kind of assumed things because we had done this partnership and we'd worked that way. Um, but things changed after my husband died and we actually made more money after he had died, um, that year, um, than we had before. So, but his impression was that, oh, it, we made more money when rock was there and that's not true. Um, but it, it makes it very official and very, uh, this is the, just very legal and it's very comforting to go to a lawyer, even if you don't want to spend the money it's not a wise decision. Just get somebody that's really good at it. If you don't want to spend the money, you can do what I did in my buyout process. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I was, I was fortunate enough um, that I had a friend who I was my uh, freshman prom date, uh, freshman winter formal date who went to law school and he needed experience. And I said, will you represent me and look over some of these contracts? Because um, I... Like I was broke, 
Like I, I had put two years of my time into that company and not really received compensation. So that's a big piece that I learned of paying yourself first and not just reinvesting everything back into the business because I was, I was financially struggling. And so while the company was doing well, I, I wasn't. <laughs> and so I, I was looking like I, I knew I needed a lawyer. $700 an hour wasn't even an option. Um, and so I found a friend and I said, would you mind looking over a couple contracts? And I just had, was fortunate enough to have some relationships where they were willing to do some pro bono work for me. And in the, in exchange for a really fantastic referral and, and my friend ended up booking a fantastic cor <laughs> corporate legal job after it because he could say he like negotiated a buyout deal. And, <laughs> and so that, that was, that was really beneficial for me and, um, him. and him. And so it was a win-win. Like. And so that that's that's there are ways to get crafty about it and get get like I said I get scrappy, um, so that piece was really important, um, and I had learned the value of having a legal set of eyes to look over things like oh it's, yes you you read over everything I do he, mm. she she has me read over all her contracts and um, I got pretty adept at speaking legalese. What would you advise for people who are in a partnership? they want to try to make it work make sure that you have alignment of values like that's that's the first and foremost make sure that you have absolute clarity on the values in which you are building the business it's one of the things because one of the things when you're starting a partnership you're so passionate about the thing about the product about the service that you're providing but having and we had you know clear operation terms and operation ops agreements and whatnot like that but we weren't clear on what I call the subconscious structure of a business, which is the values, how you make decisions, your leadership. This is the stuff that is about working when they say working on your business instead of in your business. It's working on your business as a separate entity than you and removing your identity from the business because both of myself and my business partner, our identities were heavily wrapped into the company, which thus we brought our own personal sets of values into mm -hmm. it. And one of my personal sets of values is freedom. Um, and I work fast versus my my partner was a little bit more methodic. And he had some really amazing qualities as far as admin work was concerned. But it was just a mismatch of how we made decisions. It was a mismatch of the values. It was a mismatch in how we saw um, the the trajectory of the project of the product going um and thus it, like looking back i would if i was presented with an opportunity like that i would definitely if i would if we weren't on the same page i would definitely say you know what if if you want to take it in that direction rock on i'm like this is i would charge a consulting fee and then that would be what it was instead mm -hmm. of wanting to come on as partner and it's better to negotiate right at the beginning as much as you can because that's when you're all positive and yeah uh, mm -hmm. and it's, it's it's almost like creating a prenup like your ops agreement is supposed to be like that but our operating agreement didn't have really much about what would happen if anything were to happen to the partnership or if any disagreements and like the that experience of and also fight like fighting like choosing to fight for what you what you earned and like yeah. I I made sure to that I was like I'm not leaving this company without proper compensation for the two years of time investment and effort that I've put into it um and that that was a key piece of also holding your boundaries and also one of the things that I tell my clients who I've, I've I now I, I'm so blessed I went through that experience because I've now helped guided helped guide so many of my clients through their own buyout experiences or just having an employee who wasn't a right fit for their values system be able to leave and exit gracefully instead of mm -hmm. um, this big you know drama and one of the things that um, I just see is when you can really advocate for yourself and also know where your boundary is and where your energy is valued. So for me, I got to the point through the buyout process of seeing how crappily I was feeling from some of the uh, responses that I was receiving that I just delegated those responses to be read by my husband. And then he would filter them through because I realized the value of my energy 
at, as I was going to embark onto something new, A, I was getting married and B, I had no idea what I was going to be doing next. But I just, I knew intrinsically that my energy as a leader did not need to have this, the, the negativity in it. And if I had a filter, go through some of the complaints, go through some of the issues and then kind of respond back to me in a loving way, then I would be able to process it much, much more positively and be able to have a stronger uh, response rather than that initial like gut fight, flight, freeze reaction. Mm. And so I've seen that even with clients, even with, you know, dealing with customer complaints like or customer issues, like having somebody, whether it's a customer support team, an assistant, just to be able to kind of guide you through the request and or either that or prep you for what you're going to receive. So then that way you're in a really good energetic space instead of responding emotionally and reactively. Yes. And that I that I found out, too. Um, I was um, dealing. We were having a windstorm and I this is pre computers and I had lists of emergencies and a list of go back to. And I got a call from a customer saying, I just need somebody to come out. And I said, you don't understand. I'm dealing with all this stuff. And he said, I don't care what you're dealing with. I need this. And I, that's when I learned the emotion and reacting emotionally. That's not something you put into responses with a customer. Like if you have a customer that calls up and he complains and you're really, oh, that didn't happen that way. That's step back and let yourself cool down before you respond because it it does not work out favorably for the company if it's an emotional response even a bad yelp review like be kind <laughs> be kind understanding uh, yeah. in and take a moment to because there's a huge difference between responding and reacting and emotional responsiveness is very important for a leader but emotional reactivity it 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 burns you every time I had a situation once, the only situation where I've ever left a client negatively. And it was, there was just a huge miscommunication about something as I was transitioning out. And I realized what it was. And I left this very nice, she was, she was in Europe, but I left this WhatsApp voice message to me like, oh, I realized our confusion. Can you please get back to me as soon as you can? And I didn't realize she told me this later, but she was waiting to respond because she was trying to get in a good emotional space. And then in the meantime, her lawyer sent me an email and I just went off because I was like trying to be nice. So I thought she had told the lawyer to send an email. That was not what had happened. It was just like bad timing. And I left a horrible, nasty voice message, just like angry and I always look back on that and just like, wow, I'm so embarrassed. Like you have those learning moments, like you did Mary Beth, like where you're like, well, I've got all this other stuff going on. And it's like, you just learn from it. And, and since then, like you said, Mary Beth, I take a step back. If I receive anything negative, I do not let myself respond to it. And I go take a walk or something until my thought process can break away from it. And I think about something else. That's kind of what I call it for me, at least it's like breaking you know, because you obsess, you just think about it, think about it, think about it, think about it. But if I can take a walk and if I can stop thinking about it and get distracted, then I'm like, okay, now I can come back and deal with it in a responsible manner. So Kimberly, what advice do you have for women when they're stuck in that, like you had that period where you'd gotten bought out and you didn't know what you're going to do next. And what advice do you have for women who get stuck in that sometimes we're starting new ventures? Don't spend money. <laughs> <laughs> I got myself into $40,000 worth of debt. So um, like that's, but to be, to be real clear, like that's one piece, but it's really the thing that you're seeking is clarity. Clarity is not going to come. Clarity comes, it's an internal thing. So at the very, if you do spend money, find, spend money on coaching for clarity getting or or whether it's a mastermind or going out for coffee with your your be business bestie or an actual coach investing in someone who can help you gain clarity on what specifically it is that is the problem that you're solving in your business that is what can or, and even if you want to solve that problem like I don't think I was emotionally ready to get back in the business game cuz I had some trauma responses that I needed to process. And that 
being aware of your own personal development and emotional development and what needs to grow. Not always is it your business that needs to grow and you need to hit the ground with both feet running at the very next second after an experience, like being bought out or or losing a business or a, all that. Like sometimes you need the space. Sometimes you need to enjoy the space. And being able to have the space to just think, to just be, and to also be able to get that clarity on what it is next that you really want to be doing. Like like I said, like I, I leaped in and I said, it's going to be something like Marie Forleo. But I didn't know what that was. I didn't know how to monetize it. I didn't have any structure. I didn't have any systems. I just saw the external, bought into the external, and then kind of winged it along the way. But because I didn't have clarity on the values that I wanted to bring through into my business, I wasn't either leading with those values, which no wonder my business was making no money because I was preaching values of ownership and authenticity, but I was struggling with my own ownership and I was feeling a bit like a victim because I felt like in some way that I had lost my company, um, my my e-commerce company. Um, and I was in a state of blame, blaming my former business partner, blaming myself. So I had a lot of emotional regulation that I needed to do and healing before I venturing into these values of what I knew and saw my business could be, which it is today, because I fully am in ownership and in authenticity and in servant leadership. But because I wasn't living those, it felt more like a facade than anything. And so being clear and then when is understanding when can you start embodying the values that you want your business to have? Because that's the key as, as a leader is you're going to have to embody those values and lead with those because you, everyone else will follow that. And you you set the tone as as the leader. And so when you can see when do I, like being really okay and clear with yourself is like, when do I need space? Like, and honest. Because not always is it the next Everest that you need to climb. Maybe you just need to stay at base camp for a little while and breathe. Hmm. If you could distill down into one sentence or even a few words, what do you think is the biggest influence that your parents left on you as a business owner? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> you're, both, you're both stumped. <laughs> I would say, um, like, just a drive, like, the, and the freedom that comes from entrepreneurship. Like, I was blessed to see my parents create something from nothing and, and grow that. And the fun challenge um, of being able to see that and say, like, I wonder what I could do in less time now having kind of learned vicariously these lessons as that they created and that they kind of set the ground floor for me. So mm -hmm. that's that hunger for the, the impact that I saw that they had. And like, I mean, my mom, I definitely saw the, just the, some leadership values of being able to be kind of the spearhead and then my dad was really the value of his influence um he was incredibly skilled at influence and persuasion um and not in a sleazy way but just genuinely he genuinely cared about people and, and he connected really and he well. connected really well and he was really solid on being other people's champions and being their cheerleader and would um spend his nights like up and the funny part of the story here's the crazy but part you didn't finish the thought encouraging people by email yeah he would encourage people encourage people but the funny thing was is that they also showed me that dreams manifest when they're supposed to my dad did end up becoming a famous actor because he was a famous youtuber and he got on a, a <laughs> yeah so at, toward the end of his life he got offered an opportunity to be on a youtube show called elders react and when he died he had like eighty thousand people mourning his his loss uh when he passed so it was 
it was a really phenomenal example of like dreams manifest in time. And sometimes if you give them enough time, your success and whatever it is that you want to achieve is inevitable. I like that. All right, Mary Beth, for you, what advice do you have for other women as they are trying to grow their business and hit seven figures? And why do you think some women fail or hit roadblocks? Well, I never thought of it as, uh, it's funny, I never thought of, I'm a woman doing something that's a man's job. I just never thought of that. Um, I remember going out for a bid for an architectural firm and the guy one of the reactions he had was, you, you, you're doing the bid, you, yourself, you know, you're a woman doing it. Mm -hmm. But generally, I didn't run into that. And I never thought of it that way. I never thought, oh, I'm breaking ground. I'm just doing what needed to be done. And so I never thought of that. But when I think of starting a business, I think, be cautious. I'm more practical. Be cautious with your funds. What I noticed with the tree business when people advertised in telephone books is that brand new tree services would take out a full page ad and spend all this money uh, go into debt and buy brand new equipment or something like that and then they might not survive because they've got this crushing debt so having the office in the home being practical on how you spend your money um, when you're just starting out where is where will I get more bang for my buck type thing that type of thinking, I think, when people start out, um, because I have seen people start stuff and spending time, a lot of time, what Kim was saying on the, you know, a lot of looking good, but no customers type thing. So be cautious with how you're spending money. Like Because I had a graphic art background when we were in the telephone pages, I knew, okay, if I do the ad smaller, spend less money, but make it red, or is it going to be on what side of the page it's going to be on? You know, I could control it in that factor. When it got to the internet, it got a little bit more, uh, you know, once you set up the book, the telephone book, it was done for the year. But the internet is an ongoing advertising thing that really became uh, more work and involvement that I really wanted to spend on it. But um, and that's where I came in. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's for her generation. But I remember thinking, how can I spend the money and get the best response and notice without spending a massive amount of money? Where am I going to put my money to get the as I said, bang, best bang for your buck. And I think a lot of people, when they go into business, go, oh, I'm going to have, you know, an office and a, a website. A CEO. Um, I remember in college, um, my husband started a singing group to entertain the troops because Vietnam was on. And everybody, we're talking about 12 people maybe, and everybody was concerned about their title. And I'm going, title? What? difference does it make you know you're the music director of 12 people you know uh, I mean it's it, it just they got so involved with that sort of thing when I'm going let's get a show together and just do it you know rather yeah, than just do it so I never really thought about when I was uh, a woman doing it I just thought it was kind of fun that uh, like I said to go to these educational uh, conferences and go oh okay this is really cool this is different and I started to count the women that were in them and it has increased but it still is basically a man's business because not many women climb though there are um, training now and they're giving contests for women that are climbers but I would have never been a climber I, I was interested in doing bids and seeing it and I to use my art in a way as I could sketch a limb and say, okay, this is the limb that's got to be done this way um, on the bid and everything like that. So and that I, was fun. I think um, like I, I, I too have seen the, the role problem and I've seen a lot of coaches market from like, you know, become the CEO and I'm like CEO of what? Like when I speak and work with CEOs who have zero em employees or have no team, it's very different than you're, when you're working with a CEO who has a team of 50 employees. And the coaching is different. The problems are different. And the level of responsibility is different as well. Um, it's whether they're employees or freelancers doesn't always make the big difference. But what does make the big difference is 
in what people perceive that role of CEO to be. And most people don't who start a business don't go in and research what that means. They think a CEO, I, I, what I've seen is a lot of people start a business because they have a certain skill set and they think, oh, okay, I'm really good at this. I'm going to start a business around this. Well, what you've just done is you've created about 25 different roles now that are not in your skill set, financial, bookkeeping, accounting, graphic design, social media management, customer operations, all of these. How can you remove yourself from those roles as fast as possible? Because that was the one thing that my dad said that he would have done differently was um it was actually advice from my grandpa um my my mom's dad who's who's what did he say he said every time you climb a tree you're losing money because he's mm-hmm. not the supervisor he's not pulling himself away so yeah he-, he wasn't being ceo and i think my dad really struggled with that that role because he was such a doer that as he started to be relieved of a lot of responsibility as his company grew um he struggled a lot more with his mental health because he didn't perceive himself as doing like he was very when he no longer had a crew to manage because somebody else was managing it he that was that was one of the struggles that he had was he no longer didn't he didn't know what to do as a ceo and a lot of times that's why people get stuck in the doing because the thinking of a visionary ceo of a uh, is, is very different you're thinking of the overarching vision and typically you're you are doing less of the tactile working in the business and you're working more on the business creating the culture training the team um and and working in that way rather than like being in the weeds with every you know decision doing the little things tweaking the website here you you're holding the vision of what and and then allowing other people to have agency inside of your company so that he that that shift was very hard for my dad to to make, and I've seen that shift be very hard um, or more challenging, depending upon where people are in their business and what their programming has been. Um, baby boomers, and it, it is a generational thing that I've also seen that older clients of mine who may be in the baby boomer generation struggle with that that more of not being the doer consistently. Um, I think it's an, uh, a problem with a lot of small businesses that um, the owner doesn't want to release control mm-hmm. in that sense. And that's why they don't go beyond a certain point in developing the business. Yes, he did have problems with that. I kept on saying to him, look, these uh, this other company that's doing the work now, uh, many of our crew went over there, but they need training. They need your expertise and stuff. And he had difficulty seeing yeah. that. Is that, it, that, that guidance and mentorship is just as valuable as like being in the weeds and raking. Right. Mm. Well, thank you. This has been so informative and it's been so Full of knowledge. I think our audience is going to get a lot out of it. Where can we find you both if our audience wants to connect online? I know, Mary Beth, you just sold the company, so maybe that doesn't apply. But if you want to let us know, where can we find you online and connect? I'm not online. <laughs> so this- She's not online yet, but I'm. she's already researching how to build her art business online, which I was oh, super yes. proud of. <laughs> Um, so if you want to get your trees done in Los Angeles, you can always go to rockstrainhillsideservice.com. Um, the company still upholds the same values and the same, um, quality of work. So it's just under different ownership. And then if you want to receive coaching or are interested in leveraging podcasting as a lead generation strategy for your business, you can visit me at crownyourself.com. She has a fantastic idea of her her podcast. I took her podcast class and I was amazed at her follow-up and stuff like that. And I'm just saying she's got something unique that is really, really taking off. Good. And you can, like a mom. <laughs> you can go to communicationqueens.com for that. I will say my mom has always been my greatest cheerleader along with my dad that like they just they drove me to every this woman drove me to every practice, every lesson. My dad would come with me when I was in Hollywood on auditions and things and so like just being your children's champion is like the, one of the greatest gifts that you can give your kids. I love it. So if you could both answer just one at a time, what is one philosophy, mantra, or quote that you try to run your business by or ran your business by? Always make sure you collect what you're owed. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, good. All right, Kimberly, what about you? 
Um, it's a quote from Viktor Frankl. It's between stimulus and response. There's a choice. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for joining me on this interview, Kimberly and Mary Beth. I mean, if you're listening to this show in our audience, in your inner audience, if you found it valuable and informative, please do one little favor and share the show and they might get benefit from Kimberly or Mary Beth's advice. And please head over to their website, check them out as well. As a reminder, you can find me on LinkedIn or tag me on Instagram at virtuallycurie. So again, thank you so much. Sign up for our newsletter where you'll be able to hear the exclusive content coming up.